Klappen. Okay. Ja, herzlich willkommen. Äh, mein Name ist Volker Birk. Für die Leute, die mich nicht kennen, ich weiß nicht, ob das der Fall ist. Ähm, ich möchte heute ein bisschen was erzählen äh, zu einem Teilprojekt, eines Projektes, was ich mache. Und äh, das ist eben das Teilprojekt der sync protokollfamilie In Englisch? Okay, no, no problem. Then it's in English. Uh, <laughs> welcome, I'm Volker. And it's uh, hopeless as usual. Um, I want to talk about uh, a part of a project I'm doing which is called Pretty Easy Privacy. And the part of which I'm talking about is uh, named uh, PEP Sync. Sync is actually a protocol family of uh, protocols for syncing between uh, computers uh, in a way of peer to peer thinking. So it's not um, well, it's not directly the cloud, it's more that the, the icon, the logo, will be a sun, I think, because you don't need the cloud anymore. And <laughs> so it's actually a privacy project trying to avoid a cloud and deliver features um, which can be useful for hopefully many, many people. Um, actually, the project PEP is about finding a solution to uh, solve the problems which appear usually in crypto implementations when you try to apply them for the masses. And if you have a look on the crypto implementations which are available, you will see that they either are implemented in one closed platform and you're locked in. That is, for example, implementations like WhatsApp, or it's, for example, implementations like Signal. You're locked into the platform, but it actually kind of works for many people. Or the implementations are open standards. They would be available everywhere, and nearly no one is using them because it's highly complex to use them. And most people reject that. That is standards like, for example, email encryption with PGP or with SMIME. So, Basically, um, if I try to analyze what is already there uh, as crypto for the masses, nearly all implementations go into one of these two buckets. And the idea of PEP is if we can resolve that, if we can help um, with an open standard, with free software, and open standard means also other people may and are uh, invited to re-implement that, that we have open standards for crypto which are easy to use like you would have been uh, in a locked-in platform but without that special feature. And uh, that is a tough thing to do, so we are doing that now for a couple of years. We had many problems with that, especially with financing it. <laughs> And uh, today we are in the happy situation that I can say that most of the problem, especially the financing problems, are solved. So I think we are on the safe side now and can actually work. And that is why uh, I'm happy that I can present now uh, what is already in the newest beta versions of the PEP implementations, uh, which is that Sync protocol family, the first version of it, which I announced, uh, I think, on Datenspuren some um, five years ago. <laughs> so it's actually coming, it's incredible, but <laughs> we are late, I know, but uh, it's coming. Um, so if you see a uh, le lecture or saw it or watch it on video, the videos are still online, you will see that actually it's the same thing I'm talking about today, just now today I have some implementation. So. Um, the reason for things, for the things we're doing, I, I think I have tried to cover a little. There's also how we do that. And um, if you want to talk about solution, it's very good first to try to question the problem space. So for the problems, what we see with the open standards mainly is that there is no solution for key management. You know, key management is kind of easy if you have a closed platform because then you have a central <coughs> server at which you can ask for the key of the other guy, right? And if you don't have such a closed platform, and that's what uh, we are trying to achieve, we are 100% peer-to-peer, -peer. there is no central infrastructure at all with PEP, so there are even no key servers, 
So uh, it's a little tougher to organize that uh, you provide the right key to the person uh, who needs it now, right? So there is obviously key management protocols and that's a huge thing for PEP. That is our, one of our main topics. It goes uh, to the extent that we from the beginning decided not to implement own crypto at all, but just focus on those problem spaces like key management and add things there and try to use uh, crypto implementations which are well known good as engine. And the crypto implementation we started with uh, was GNUPG. You may have heard of that project, I guess. Um, it's actually an open PGP and SMIM implementation. Most people are not aware of the second one, but actually it is. Uh, it's also delivering X some X509 if you want to. And so we started with that as an engine and tried to design completely different um, protocols on top. So that's how we started and then uh, we found ourselves in the situation that we tried three or four times to talk to the GNU PG team that we could collaborate. And uh, Werner had different ideas, so Werner and I actually understand each other, uh, but we never found together, uh, unfortunately. And then something very strange happened with what I did not expect to happen was that Werner's team, uh, which is now his ex-team, showed up at my front door and was asking if, can, if they can switch to us. Uh, which is actually um, the ex GNUPG team. <laughs> and uh, uh, that which brought me into big troubles because I did not want Werner having the view that we're trying to, to drag his team out or something like that. But fortunately I was uh, Werner reacted positive. He, he told me that uh, he knows of that problem and which they had internally and he was not surprised. So, um, okay, so it was not too, too crazy. And uh, that is a reason why actually PEP Foundation today is uh, implementing crypto, which we never expected to, because uh, this team, which today is the Sequoia PGP team, uh, is implementing a PGP implementation in Rust, which is named Sequoia PGP. I don't know if you heard of that one. Uh, I can recommend to have a look on it. Um, we are using it today now uh, in all of our own implementations, so we are switching completely away from GNUPG for different reasons. I, I may provide you one reason. One reason, for example, is that my, the PEP Engine test bench, or own core, uh, needs on my laptop, the test band needs around about two and a half minutes to run through using GNUPG and it needs around about 8.5 seconds with Sequoia. So it's a little faster, <laughs> let's say, <laughs> but that's not all. It, it has, I think it's, it's really the GNUPG, ex GNUPG team trying to do a completely different design. And in my view, um, it's a candidate for, let's say, the next version of what you can do in PGP. And there's many, many other reasons too, not only performance, also features. Uh, but that would be a Sequoia lecture, and I would never do that because I would ask Neil Warfield or, uh, or one uh, of the other uh, Sequoia guys uh, to deliver that lecture because they're way better in that, <laughs> obviously, than me. You so I will go back to Pep. Best. Sorry? In Rome, there was a talk from one of the two about that. You can watch it. Okay. Yes, I know. I know the talks. That that is not the problem. Others. It's <laughs> you know Sequoia. Sequoia. They do that inside our foundation. That's Pep Foundation, who, who, which is hosting Sequoia. We got the co-financing for the project from the Holland Stiftung, and the major financing and hosting is done by Pep Foundation. But that's not what I'm talking today. Today I will talk a little about PEP, and uh, that is PEP is basically key management, trust management a little, trying to be compatible to the trust ideas of X509 and PGP, and have a mapping into that, and it's uh, about identity management, which was a, more or less a result why we are doing that. We, we are required to do it, or we had no idea how to get the key management work. Let's say, uh, 
you need to think about who that other person is to select the right key, obviously. <laughs> to give you um, uh, some idea why PEP is dealing with identity management at all. We are clearly a privacy project, we are not a security project to make a clear statement. So if security and privacy go together, we always decide for the two of them. If security and privacy contradict each other, we always opt for privacy. So you will see that we break some dogmas uh, of crypto communities. For example, I cannot honor if you sign a message but don't, don't encrypt it. I'm sorry, I'm a privacy activist. That may be even worse if you don't sign it, right? So when it's coming for privacy, if you want to have it signed and PEP is uh, rating that, then encrypt and sign. For example, just to give you uh, some example that you see that security and privacy is not always the same and PEP is very clearly on the privacy side. And so that is one reason why we work on SYNC. We see the following problem in key management especially in key management, but we see it at many other places, and we'll talk a little about that in that lecture. We see the problem that most people today have more than one device. I, I even know people having three phones, I don't know why, but they, they do it like this. Um, it's also that uh, people have a phone and a laptop, like me, so most people have more than one device, and usually that's a problem if you don't have a centralized uh, key management thing, you're not in the locked-in platform, then it's a problem that you have the keys uh, on multiple devices, the right keys which you want to have, that you can read your messages. That is mainly about messages. We already are implementing it in other spaces, other spaces too, because PEP is actually key management, and key management can be used at other places too, not only for messages, and with message PEP is starting with messages like email, chatter, text messages of all kinds. And uh, now we were asked uh, from guys we did not expect them coming to us if we can uh, encrypt their messages as well. And that's what we're actually doing now. Uh, it's the SWIFT. It's an organization between banks. And they are asking us to encrypt their money. Because that's actually text messages and PEP is just a clear fit. And so we are doing that, but that is a project which I never expected being asked, but it's actually happening now. So, I mean, is it still PGP like where you know, you're encrypting your static key? There's no, none of the ratcheting going on. I'm sorry? There's no ratcheting going on. It's still encryption of your static keys. Uh, yes and no. Um, you have to know that PEP is not, a PEP is like orthogonal to encryption. Yeah. So if your encryption implementation is doing it, th then it's there, otherwise it's static keys. So PEP, is, PEP has a backend and has uh, functions which the backend has to fulfill however it does it to deliver encryption and the PEP engine itself does not encrypt. So I, I cannot answer such questions for PEP, obviously. It's we take care about key management. For key management, we have different um, ideas. For example, we have ideas for long living keys and short living keys. That's more or less uh, how we see it. Why ever your key is short living, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, and we are generating short living keys and stuff like that, or let the crypto engine generate it, and long living keys we manage differently and stuff like that. So, that's more or less what we do. And um, however it is, in, in the end you need, for example, secret keys coming to the devices you are using, however they are generated, however they, they are connected, and uh, that is the first thing what that SYNC protocol family does. SYNC is a protocol family which has the basic idea that I have one user and the user has multiple devices, let's say two, three, four, I don't know, and the idea is now uh, can we synchronize data peer-to-peer -peer between the devices uh, over the messaging channels they already have? So PEP is always tunneling. And if we have that, then we can synchronize whatever is required to be synchronized between these devices.
to make the appearance to the user like it behaves as one system, right? And that is, that is the base, basic idea of the SYNC protocol. And SYNC is then a stack of network protocols where we think about things like, okay, first I want to have secure channels if, to synchronize data which is private. And if I want to have secure channels, then first I need to make, uh, to implement key management because then the right keys must be at the right places or you cannot encrypt or you cannot uh, organize uh, at least some privacy, then I need to organize some trust. So it's clear that I, don't, I exclude the man in the middle case and when I have that, then I have secure channels and on top of that I can implement more, um, let's say, more protocols to synchronize different types of data. That is basically the idea. PEP is always, if ever possible, a plugin into an existing messaging system. So we organize the interfaces that we are not the messengers. We are more or less support different messaging systems or different messaging applications. And of course, as usual, we are ending up with writing apps for Android and iOS. Why? Uh, because uh, the data kraken and its uh, Apple friend decided uh, that you must not have plugin concepts in their apps or they have their rules, right? So we <laughs> end up writing apps and this uh, led us even to the, for me, very strange situations that we wrote a full-featured MUA for iOS because I have no other choice. Uh, I never expected that to happen, but actually I think we'll have a, uh, we have now a release candidate and uh, we are in releasing process if you download it. Ah, by the way, all software, what PEP does is free software under a GNU license. And we have um, a multi-license strategy. So if you root an iPhone and download the PEP client, it's legal and supported. If you don't root it, then I'm sorry, you need to buy it in App Store. And <laughs> it's basically the idea. Um, which gives us a business model, but it's your own fault, root your iPhone. And so <laughs> it's just, <laughs> just supporting the both ways. And because we have a license concept, which is at least dual license, sometimes uh, even multi-license, uh, it's always possible. So we have a, a compliant EULA, which Apple made their stamp on top of it. And additionally, as an alternative, you can have the same thing downloading from the internet as GPL. So it's your choice. That's our idea. Okay, and so I'm talking now about a part of it that was nearly a pep talk, I know. Um, I'm trying to, to keep people in who don't know pep yet. Sorry for that. So I'm talking now about the protocol implementation and I decided not to have slides. Um, the reason is, I'm closely working together with people from the other side uh, of this society, which is the capitalists. And uh, for example, we have a partner now, uh, which is uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers. And there, I have no other choice to always talk using slides, because it's, it's their culture and, and you have to adapt. And I was thinking, um, in a CCC talk, I think I can organize that I just show it uh, as it should be, right? So if you don't mind, um, I intentionally skip the slides. I have plenty of slides, I can put some, but I will try to avoid them here, okay? So because I hope that the audience um, uh, will like it this way, perhaps. Okay, so that's the reason why you don't see slides, but I have graphics here if you want to. Um, because that's actually what I will talk about. It's today PEP Sync, that's the state machine. And I, I will try to explain you what's going on and why we do it like this and, and so forth. And because that looks a little complex, um, there is a good message here because uh, PEP Sync is also here. Um, and there is something, oh, I don't know if you can read that, so. No. Um, what was it said? I forgot it, I'm sorry. 
Sorry? It's called the name. Yeah, no. It's called. Yeah. I don't know if I find. Is that better or? <laughs> Can you read that? Yeah. Is yeah. there a solar? Solar? No. I have shine. <laughs> okay, let me see. I have no idea. Is that readable? Okay, then we use that one. Uh, so, um, I, I will deliver two, uh, two lectures here. The second lecture is how, how the fuck is that working? Um, because what we actually do is um, we are specialized in software generation. That means you write the protocol in a DSL, type make, and you have an implementation of it. So the magic obviously is in the generators, okay? And that will be the, the second part, like uh, the second lecture I will try to deliver is um, how the hell is that working? How can you do that? And uh, the DSL uh, toolchain is, um, I, I had a lecture here at um, this event, I think two or three years ago, where I was explaining the toolchain. So if you want to watch the video about how the toolchain works, it's already there. <laughs> it was uh, at some cousin event. And uh, so I will not talk too much about it, just give you some ideas. So this is actually a DSL implementing uh, a usual way to describe network protocols, which is actually um, a FSM, right? A finite state machine. So for the people who are not aware of that, there is different ideas for finite state machine. It's not only one idea. And so I explain shortly the idea of finite state machine, the very way which I'm working with here, so you can understand or perhaps better understand or faster understand what I'm t uh, talking about. What we are doing here is we have a state machine with a following paradigm. Obviously we have states. Then we have conditions. Then we have transitions. Then we have actions being executed. And we are in an event-based system, so we have events. And because this is a network implementation, the state machines not only receive events, they also send network messages. And receiving a network message is also an event. So basically, there is two types of events. One type is I received this network message. And the second type is I received some other event. And that is how things come together, and that way we try to describe our protocol. And when we have that protocol, we try to describe um, that, for example, two devices automatically find each other, announce to the user we could form a device group, that's a basic idea of PEP. My laptop and my phone could form a device group, and then they synchronize their data between each other. And to do that, there is a small list of ideas which I want to present just uh, if, you, if you don't mind at the source code. As you may have seen, um, I did that already. Um, there is, when you download the source code, um, we, we have that source code, of course, we have it online. So, um, uh, it's here if I would have internet, yes, if not, uh, it's not online, uh, then I'm offline. Okay, forget it. Not now. Yes, it will work probably, and probably it will, or most probably will not work. Okay, I don't care, I don't need it. Forget it. We can all use this. Yes, sure. Uh, yes, that's why it's Mercurial. <laughs> No problem. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, there's a make file in. If you make keysync SVG, you will see actually. You will see actually that we have some generator which draws this uh, sweet picture here. 
which is of course Graphis based. You may know Graphis, it's a tool where, well, the generator, when you generate things, that's really nice because the generator to draw that picture is actually not too big as well, right? It has, I think, what is it? Um, 31 lines of code, including the empty last line. So that thing draws the picture. Oh, oh, now I see the problem here. How could I switch color off? Does anyone know that? I forgot all, all of that. I never do it. Probably I know how I, I do it. Ah, syntax off, yes, you're right. Okay, so, so we can read it. Um, and you see, what I have as a tool chain is a template language, which is just spitting out source code. Just to give you an impression, but I will close that now and go back to the real thing. Oh, thank you. Okay, and try to give you an impression what we're doing here, okay? So, the first thing what I want to do is I have a phone and I have a laptop and the first thing is I want to make them find each other. Because I'm doing that for users which are absolutely non-hackers. Usually people specialized on PGP either love or hate PEP. We'll see basically two groups. There is also PEP haters and that's okay because they get into troubles with PEP because after that you don't need their consulting anymore. And this is really, if you read for example the newest IX, you will find an article where a PGP expert bashes PEP. And it's one from German intelligence service named BSE by the way. And that's also not by accident. So that is intended. And uh, you will see that the guy has no arguments to bash it because he is finding, in, in, in the summary, he's finding two arguments against PEP. You can read it in the newest IX and you see it yourself. First argument, well, people knowing what they're doing could be, could be feeling bad about PEP because it's doing it itself. Second argument, because he only tested Enigma, which is not from us, we don't do Enigma, the Enigma project is doing Enigma. They asked us if they can have PEP functionality, we provided the distribution of PEP and they put it into Enigma. That's the Enigma project. So the only thing he tested is Enigma. And he is telling us for new users the menu is too complex. By the way, that's, you can read it in the newest IX, not kidding. It's really funny because the normal Enigma menu has, I think, 20 lines, 20 menu entries. If you're in pet mode, it has three. So, but that's his argument. You can read it on four pages in the newest IX. Have fun with that article. We decided not to comment on it because when it's getting too stupid, we, we stop with that. I right? confused the normal menu with the Enigma, uh, the Enigma menu. I will not comment on that. That's, that's an opinion. I'm fine with that. I, I don't share that opinion, obviously. But let's see. So we're doing here different things. So my users are the users, when it works, they forget that it's here, right? That's my users. If it does not work, they, take, they pick up the phone to call someone who understands. That's my users. I'm sorry, no one in this room probably is in my target group. I'm not doing it for me. I'm not doing it for you guys, I'm so sorry. I'm doing it for that small group of 7.5 billion people who don't have our knowledge. <laughs> okay? So that's my target group. So if you feel insecure having something which manages your keys, guys, there's good software already there where you can do it yourself. And please don't use that, okay? If you want that. If you're lazy as me, or unaware of the problems how to handle keys, like those small group of 7.5 billion, then you may use PEP, okay? And I will not put features into it where you can do it manually. 
because that is the wrong software for you. Okay, just to make a clear statement in the beginning, because I, I had that discussion so often now. So, my, so the target is here. I have a user having a laptop and a phone, let's say, in, in the first example. And the user is, is, wants to experience the following. He is configuring this thing, let's say, for his email account. We all still use email, even if you use WhatsApp for everything. Why? Because you need email to buy things in the internet, right? So everyone still is using email, just for that discussion. So, you may just configure whatever you use for email. Let's say you use Gmail in a webmailer, or you are in a company and use Microsoft Outlook, right? That's what people do, I think. You may dislike that. <laughs> but actually it's a fact, right? People do such things. Or you have some phone here and use it on your phone. And now the first step would be, can we make it appearing like this? I have already a laptop. I buy a new phone and configure my email account. And then that beast says to me, well, I found also a second device. We could form a device group and synchronize our data. Do you want that? And then deliver a possibility to check if that is secure or if there is a man in the middle, right? And PEP already has a method which we prefer to check if there is something man in the middle or um, if you can compare two, two types of things and if they identical, then there's probably no man in the middle. And now it's not fingerprints. Well, actually, technically it is. But why it's not fingerprints? Well, to be honest about fingerprints, I see in the wild, in reality, I see two types of fingerprints checking. First types, they don't do it. That's the most common one. That's the most common implementation of fingerprint checking. Um, second type of fingerprint checking, People check 32 bits because then they are secure. Because 32 bits is obviously enough <laughs> no, to exclude collisions, right? We all know that's not true, but that's what everyone does. How do they do it? Well, can we just check the first group and the last group of the key? Ever heard of that? <laughs> that's actually, you know, a group is 16 bits, so two groups obviously is 32 bits, so that's the assumption, right? <laughs> so, so, um, let's say, because I'm a little pessimistic about real-world implementations of actual fingerprint checks, we try to find something which is better than that, okay? Maybe it's not as good as do a real fingerprint check with a full fingerprint, which really should be done, but no one does it. Okay, some nerds in their party, they organize for that. With that exception, nearly no one does it. So we have the idea to map that hex codes to words of your mother's tongue. But that is unfortunately not what I will talk about today, because it's in the other lecture already, which I delivered about how PEP, um, what are the PEP concepts. So we are already in sync, but you will find that again, when we show a dialogue where you can accept that this should form a group, you will see the trust words again, right? and the trust words deliver enough bits that you're more secure than what I was explaining for sure. There's a, there's random off topic, there's a, at some point somebody came up with a scheme for doing what they call key poems, which is essentially the same thing, but they make it rhyme. Uh, it's more, <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. Uh, it's, uh, technically, it's more like PGP word list, just that PGP word list, in my view, is a misdesign and we're just doing it the other way around. But I, I cannot talk too much about it, I cannot talk about Silk anymore, because that is part of the, the PEP lecture. I'm just mentioning that there is something like a list of five up to ten words, uh, which you see, and if you compare it on the two devices, uh, that's actually calculated out of dictionary using the FPL. Okay. So, how can we do that? How can we make these two devices find each other? First question, do we have a communication channel which will, which will work for sure? Right? Because that's two devices, and if they cannot communicate in any way, then we are 
doomed already, right? And again, PEP is not based on infrastructure we provide. There may be infrastructure in the, what we call transports, that is, for example, for email, obviously there's probably some MTAs on the line, right? Or email will not work, I guess. <laughs> but this is not our infrastructure. We expect that some transport is being used, for example, email, and if that is the case, then we base all, everything on that infrastructure and don't deliver our own infrastructure, and what we do is, in our layer, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, okay? And yes, of course we want NuNet, obviously, and the reason should be clear why. Okay, so what we're doing is we're deciding if a device was already grouped or not and have different states for it. So just to comment on that. The PEP protocols are all modeled in state machines, but there's two different implementation of it. One is the hard-coded one, which is just storing the state in the database, and you have the transitions as API to the app. And the second one is like this. This will be a state machine which will run on a thread. Most probably, we also have the possibility for single-threaded implementation with all other things together, but most probably it will run on an extra thread threat and it will be, uh, uh, the data will be uh, only uh, volatile or transient, it will not be persistent, right? So the first thing which I do is when I start the state machine is if I will, if I'm already grouped, member of such a group or not. And if I'm not, I'm so. And what we're doing here is we have the following concept we have a message which is called beacon. Well, yes, that does not sound like a PEP invention, and you're right, probably not. But where do we send to? The basic idea of PEP is that whatever messaging system you use, in my example, email, you have any type of inbox, because you need something where the messages come out, right, as a user. And so what we're actually doing is we're sending these messages to ourselves as messages of the underlying transport. And that means we generate the email, encode our stuff in, and send it to our own email address. Why are we doing that? Sounds pretty useless. Who is sending emails to himself? Well, may maybe if you're mind sick or something, or you have no, you're alone and have no other people to talk to. Uh, no, there's, there's another option. You have two devices configured on at least one common email address which is usually the one you buy things on the internet, by the way. <laughs> That's what you have, check it at home, what you have on your different devices. And so I can send an email to a place where all devices can read it, right? Which is your own inbox. And that gave the idea, so we are using the inbox of the transport actually as our, um, yes, as our message bus, right? So PEP is actually, tunneling through the underlying message protocol of the transport, in this case email, and PEP sync itself is encoded in ASN1. And of course we heard it from the IATF, they dislike ASN1 because it's from the ISO, everything which is from the ISO is bad, because it's not from the IATF, obviously. Uh, I don't give a shit on that, and yes, you can have it on video because there's a reason for that decision <laughs> and I still think for our case that may be so true for many many other implementations for our problem I think it's a good choice and that's what I wanted to show you why what we do is um, um, it should be here, no not here oops then it should be here. Uh, um, if it's small or big letter, it's not random or arbitrary with uh, ASM1. They decide in the standard where you have to have a big and where you have. It's even worse than Java, yes. So, um, what we generate is we generate an ASM1 grammar. That's an ASN1 grammar here, which is reflecting what does need to be encoded in that message following that implementation. 
And so you see, um, and that will be part of my next lecture, it's, it's quite a multi-level generation thing, right? So for example, out of the DSL we generate ASN1, out of ASN1 we generate an ASN1 codec. Using uh, a codec of ASN1 to encode, which they do. Yes, it's double. <laughs> yes, if you decided for ASN1, it's not already clear which uh, binary codec it will be, because then ASN1 has the concept that there is a list of possibilities, and what we are using is PER, packed encoding rules of ASN1. And that gives small, very small binary files. And the protocol is designed that those binary files, if you push them through base64, all of them, for all common cases, will fit into an SMS. That gave the limit. Of course, there's cases where we need to split them on more than one SMS. But PEP is not email, you know. PEP is designed for arbitrary message uh, transport, so the design obviously needs to reflect that. And so this, this stuff here is being generated then, this ASN1 grammar, and we generate that out of that state machine, and that is why I'm showing that one first. And so what we're doing here, we decided for a beacon, and the beacon is defined here. Uh, that's the beacon definition. And what we actually do is, we decided for having a challenge. The challenge is a transaction ID, and the transaction ID with PET is defined as a UUID type 4. For the people who may be unaware of what that is, it's a long random string. Well, uh, not long. <laughs> okay. Not long enough. Sorry? Not long enough. Not what enough? Not long enough. Not long enough. There's just not entropy in there. It's not the fun. Okay. <laughs> if, if you find it's not long enough, well, I don't think many people share your opinion it's because it's quite long. Okay. So that's a challenge. Well, wasn't it 128 bits? Yeah, I mean, uh, normal hash is close to like hard count nowadays. And you know, type 4 is completely random? There's different UUIDs, you know that? Mm -hmm. There's types, okay. Yeah, I mean. So that is a 128 bit random. Okay, why are we doing that? Because we have the idea, we have a, a special type of message bus here. Our message bus is world writable but can be read only by the right user by definition why is it world writable how can you write other people's inboxes i have a hint for you send an email right it will end up in the inbox so you can write every inbox on planet so the idea is because that is the case for uh, reasons about don't tamper with me too much don't make it too easy to tamper with it we do the following we only work with people who can read the beacon. Because everyone can write one, but can you read it? If you can read it and answer with the right challenge, then you may be a respected partner, otherwise for sure not. And that is a result of that special situation that, uh, yes, that we have a message bus which is both writable, but only readable by one user, right? That's how it's defined, if the security will work. That's another topic. Okay, so that is why we have that channel challenge. And in the next message, it's needed to answer with a copy of that challenge or you're not accepted. You're frankly ignored, your beacon will be ignored. Or your answer will be ignored to be, to be correct. Okay, so what we do here, I go back to the top, go back to the state soul where we were, so what we do is, I will not comment on all of them, but what we will do is we calculate new random numbers and use them from there. And then we send beacons. Initially already we send a beacon. We also send beacons in case, for example, a new short-living key was being generated, so we send a beacon. We only do that if we are sold, by the way. If you're grouped, we don't send beacons. 
and uh, there is like a safeguard here. And what we're doing then is when we receive a beacon, in case we get the event beacon received, then if it's the same challenge which we use, probably it was our own beacon because that's the next problem of my special message bus. Well, I get my own messages in copy, right? And I should skip them. It's not a good idea uh, to react on my own beacons because uh, I will stay sole even if I group, I think. Right? So, <laughs> we should avoid that one. What do you do if the user is using cache pair with pop three? What do you do if the user is using cache pair with pop three? Not support it. Oh, sorry. We will not support pop three. Uh, don't forget, Christian, I only have those small pe group, people's group, only the 7.5 billion, right? Not all the, the major group, which is important. Some okay? Be older. And uh, nearly no one of them even heard of POP3, but they all know Gmail. <laughs> okay? That's, a, that's, a, that's the reality we are in, right? I don't say I like that reality. I'm not a big fan of the data cracking, to be honest. Uh, it would be a surprise if a privacy activist would be, wouldn't it? Okay, but that's actually the case. So, I don't give a shit on POP3, but I need to carefully think about Gmail. That's my job. I'm sorry for that. It's really bad, but it's actually the case. Okay, so that's what we do. And then I want to have some handshaking that the two devices find each other. I, did, I opted for a classical three-way handshake, but a classical three-way handshake has a small disadvantage here because it's asynchronous and it's asymmetric, right? Asynchronous is okay, asymmetric is a problem, because actually if you have two sole devices for the beginning trying to find each other, it's absolutely symmetric, right? So the very first decision which is to, to make is can we decide for roles? It's not so important which side takes which role, but two different ones, please, right? And it would be nice if each side knows if they don't take the same side, right? <laughs> so, this is the same role. And that is where we have roles. We call the two roles uh, requester and offerer because PepSync is based on a distributed transaction model. So many of the names you will find here are out of the namespace, let's say, of distributed transactions. So what I do here is someone is requesting a distributed transaction and someone then is agreeing on that and offering the transaction number and the other one takes it and if that is with a three-way handshake then it's actually um, that the transaction is open and then the transaction can be closed by commit yes and commit no or commit accept and commit reject which is exactly the same I don't know if anyone here in the room is aware of distributed transactions. That's how you do distributed transactions. Either you, you commit them with accept or with reject, or you roll them back because cancel, right? And that is the way the words you will find in the PepSync protocol because actually we are now already into the topic of having a distributed transaction. And my transaction makes it's secure that the two devices find each other and the user checks the trust words and says it's okay to have it. And I want to have that in a transaction, right? So avoiding, let's say, attacks like with race conditions, timing and stuff like that. That's why I want to have it in the form of a distributed transaction. So that gave the names. Um, how do they decide who takes the offer role, the other the requester role, how do they decide that? Well, both have, have a challenge, and it's really trivial. I check which challenge is smaller than the other. They are both random, and that's on both sides available, right? And so the smaller one will be requester, the bigger one will be offerer for no reason, because it does not matter. So that's what we do. And what we do is, if we are the requester, if we are offerer, we don't send the request, obviously, but we send another beacon. Why? 
that's another race condition. If you design network protocols, race conditions are always there. It's a race condition because we may have read a beacon and answered that, but the beacon may be just right before expiry. And then the other is not there anymore. And we shouldn't leave our state or we will be locked in, right? And you have such things, I will not go into too many details without a beer, um, <laughs> but because you have such situations, somehow you send one beacon more, right? To be sure that the other side is there and will react on it. It's not just the race condition that you react, but they are already out. Okay. And, and your old beacon already disappeared, right? And uh, if we are a requester, we open the negotiation, and then there's something special. This here is an action which is um, following a convention in the implementation of SYNC, which I have to comment on. SYNC is using an input-output buffer, and the input-output buffer is being used when a message com comes in, there is the data. And if you modify the data and send out, then the parts of the in-out buffer, uh, it's like the superset of all fields, those parts are being used to send out the message. So it's very easy to copy, which is basically do nothing, right? And it's not so easy, if it's not a copy, then you write in what will change here. And this action, I will show how the implementation works in the next lecture, as I announced. So now I will set the bit that this is not a group, because we already know that we are not the group, but the other side cannot know, because we accept their beacon, and groups are accepting beacons, but they never send. So what we do is, we make it sure that the other side gets informed that they are negotiating uh, with another sole device. Now we are already asymmetric, and because of that, we can do it only in one row. And, well, yes, then we send out the request, Send means we send actually a network message. And the, uh, all network messages are in the same DSL. They are just uh, at the end uh, moment here. So that is a negotiation request. Uh, the transaction to, to establish the trust is called negotiation. That's how we caught it. So that's uh, now we are in the transaction. Um, well, repeat the challenge or we ignore you. Yes, yeah, some versioning because it may be two PEP clients with different versions, right? Then we fall back to, to, to old protocol and stuff like that. And then um, we have another transaction ID which is the ID of the negotiation. And yes, transactions should have and must have uh, transaction IDs. And I think my friend Christian here in the room, can you tell an example? If you don't have it, how, how doomed you are, right? He just told me. But, <laughs> but uh, so that is why we, we want to have it, okay? And the negotiation is derivated from the two challenges by XOR. Why? Well, I have, I have a special case here. Again, my message bus has special properties. I get a copy of all what I send in. Everyone reads every message. It's like broadcast, in a way. And it's world writable. So I have really special um, things to think about. And I have totally, let's say, um, I have devices which I have a user, when the user decides, oh no, that's enough, I switch it off, right? Then it will happen. I need to deal with that situation. It's not possible, I have nothing reliable here, right? It's really not a good situation if you design a network protocol, if you're in the situation we are in now. That's usually not what you hope for. Uh, I don't think uh, a common TCP in, uh, implementation even is, uh, well, then the socket will time out, right? <laughs> if you just shut down one box. And to avoid too many timeouts, because actually I have a user here in, I need to avoid all timeouts I can, right? And if I have no idea, it will be a timeout. 
but I have a user here in, so I do the full handshake while one state. Because only if I have one state, I will probably not time out, right? Because timeouting means you're in a state which you can only leave with one message, the message never arrives, and then you time out back to, the, to a root state, let's say, right? And I do the full handshake in the root state. <laughs> And I cannot just switch t states or I will have the timeout problem because my user will be disappointed when he clicks around and it does not work any anymore and he throws it away, right? And Pep is butchered. I, I, I tend to agree to the P2P guys and stuff like that, right? Okay, that should not happen. So, actually, in states, so many, many things are happening. So not only in it and keychain and cannot decrypt and not only what is what if a beacon arrives, also what if a negotiation request arrives. In, in normal network protocols, it's the next state, right? Waiting for the request now, or even the answer is here. The answer is here because I don't want to leave the state until the transaction is done, right? And so it's like a transaction, and so there's a, a, some crazy things in that design, let's say, which you don't, which you usually don't find in other network protocols, but just in other state. Okay, so when we are requester, obviously we sent out the request that gave the name, by the way. Surprise, surprise. And uh, if you're on the other side, then uh, well, then you receive the request. And if you receive the request, you do the same. If it was me, ignore. Why is that in? Uh, well, because it's one state, right? So there is one if more. And then store it and send the acceptance, which is negotiate an open, transaction opened, which means, uh, well, yes, I have it, and I accepted the transaction ID, and now we're on the same page, right? And when you receive that, then we can start with the real thing. And that is what we actually do then. We go handshaking and that is where the protocol gets being split because it's a little different to handshake with a group than it's handshaking between two soul devices. Okay. And that's the last thing. Still in the same state. You may you may, may be the requester and now you get the handshake open and that means you're sure the other got the message and they accepted the transaction ID so we are on the same page so we, we have that thing and uh, we can just switch states and that is where we actually leave the states, right? Not before and that, uh, if you compare it to other network protocols that's fairly uncommon. Usually, usually you just leave when, when, when accepting some message, right? But that's why. Okay. Still, our user sees nothing. It's just on the line, right? Why does he see not nothing? Well, because if it's a PEP client, there's emails PEP does not show, or you switch on the option. Obviously, we need something like that because now we're generating emails, <laughs> sending them to ourselves, having binary sync attachments, right? That's how it works. And so users could get confused. Wow, I have plenty of, I have now three emails. Well, beacon, oh, maybe four, another beacon, um, a handshake request, and maybe uh, a open, so it's already four, right? In my inbox, three emails, four emails appear, uh, what is that? And usually the emails are marked in different ways, also in the header, so it's easy to filter them out and then show them to normal users. If you have a look on it, which is still supported, because PEP formats are backwards compatible to PGP. So if one of your devices is a PGP device, which will probably not take a share in, in the SYNC protocol, unfortunately, or we publish that, we try to make it a standard, we invite PGP implementations to support it, by the way. So they can join in, but then they need to find an own solution how to hide uh, the technical messages, let's say, and that is why those messages contain subjects and texts in the body like this is an automatically generated message by PEP, you can safely ignore or even delete it. And it will disappear itself if you don't delete it, which will be the case because the PEP implementations, when these things expire, 
they take it from, from the inbox. Why inbox, why not the subfolder? Well, we discussed the subfolder lately, uh, and it has a big disadvantage, which is called uh, GMX. You may have heard of that one. Ever heard of GMX? It's not so common in Switzerland, I think, but more common in Germany. Uh, we were told that if you have the free version of GMX, your contract may only offer 10 folders. And so that would require, if you want to sync your devices, that you actually buy an upgrade. <laughs> so, may I have a radical question? Yes. Why don't you use the trash folder? Uh, that was also a discussion, but the problem is, in some implementation, trash is in the network, in others not. And it's even worse, for both things you find people with strong opinions. <laughs> so, you know, what you actually try to do when you try to serve common users, you try, if there is even a field where there's strong opinions, your first question is, can we avoid it? Okay? Uh, I, I, need, I need the trash folder in the net because uh, I'm exchanging my data through it. Or what? <laughs> what are you doing? Well, I throw what I need on my laptop, I throw into the trash, and then I take it out on my laptop. <laughs> Not kidding. And that's only one of the services. So that's, for example, someone who will opt, obviously, I think, for having trash on the net. Guess what some crypto guys say if you have your trash folder on the net? They will recommend at least to encrypt it, right? So people start to encrypt their trash. Okay, I will stop here. <laughs> Let's say it's difficult. So we still are in the inbox. That's the result of the discussion. Let's see where that will lead us to. And now we have, by the way, the problem that inbox is complicated for Microsoft Outlook. You may have heard of Microsoft Outlook. Um, it's, um, it's like a bundled implementation of race conditions. <laughs> right? It's, it's, um, I, think, I think the compiler is derivated from C++. It's not really C++, but it's somehow kind of C++. And people are implementing, which are implementing uh, Outlook dislike C++. I, I will not say more. At least they never had a clear look on it, but that's another topic. Okay, so for example, Outlook has problems like uh, inbox is something which is not reliable, and it's something which, of course, is full of race conditions because everything is a race condition in Outlook. There's no exception, I think. I did not find any. For example, in Outlook, when you send three emails to Outlook, then they may just um, change their sequence they are coming in. So we tested that. You, you send, you have an exchange server and you have Outlook and send a message to yourself. And you, you do that three times and they may appear in a different sequence. May. It's not must. Okay? And things like that. So, okay, that's another story. So uh, to implement that in practice, that's not enough. Uh, obviously, our Outlook developers have much fun. It's really a nice thing to develop for Microsoft Outlook. I still did not deliver that lecture. I could still offer it, which is uh, the worst of Outlook and Exchange, if you're interested. Then. So, <laughs> um, yes, you, you need uh, probably rubber boots <laughs> until here, right? <laughs> Depending on, on how deep we dive in. Okay, so what you're actually doing here is Now we are handshaking. Transaction is open. We are handshaking. And so now we inform the user, right? And we inform the user by showing the trustworthy dialog. And now there's different types of trustworthy dialogs. Like, um, I found another device. Shall, shall we form a device group? Or, I found that you already have a group of devices. Shall we join, right? So there's options here. So we show uh, the matching handshake dialog and then we have different options. We are in a network, 
So I have my own user pressing cancel or the same user probably, hopefully, or the attacker, um, same user pressing cancel but on the other device, right? So it's different if my user presses cancel where my state machine runs, where I am, or if they press cancel on the other device, right? So I need to deal with both cases. In a group, it's a little more complex because in a group, they may press cancel on any device. But if they do it on a group device, it has another meaning if, uh, than if they do it on the still sole device, right? Because what they press on any group device is responsible for the full group, while what they press on the sole device is only for this one, right? So you see the asymmetric case and the symmetric case, and we are now still in the case that we have two devices and two devices try to find each other and form a group, okay? We're not more. So, if my user presses cancel, I get a cancel event. Again, these are events. Receiving a message is an event, but there is more than these events, right? For example, pressing cancel on the trustworthy di dialog is also an event. It's not a network message if it's the local one, but it's an event. And you see uh, why I opted for that design here, so I can handle them the same way, right? So either I get a cancel, then I send out a rollback, because cancel usually means not now. And if I get a rollback and it's valid, it's from my partner, then I also cancel, right? That is the case that my partner uh, got a cancel click and sent the rollback. And then I roll back the transaction and go back to so and do nothing else, right? And so, if my, 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 uh, uh, wait, wait. if you go back to Seoul, do you run the init of Seoul again, which means you send out a beacon? Yes. Which means the dialog pops up again, do you want to send with the other device? No. Why not? Yes. Okay. <laughs> because of timing. It will come again, I think, in uh, 60 seconds. Oh, okay. So I'm just getting every 60 seconds. Yes. Oh, wow. Yes, you have another choice than cancel. Cancel means not now, um, but maybe later. Not now, I need to, to go back to contacts and find something. There is a way to reject it and that disables it. So you also have a reject button and the re reject button has two functions. Uh, where were we? Let me see on the negotiation request. I think we were here. No. I lost it. Here we were, I think. Yeah, yes. Just we were at the other one, right? We were. We were here, I think. Yes. So um, we may get a reject. Reject means. Uh, disable it, it also means, uh, well, the trust words don't match. Reject means no. And we decided to switch it off until you switch it on again. So it's, it's more or less coming close to what people expect from such buttons, I think. We are not sure yet, okay? And it's, all, it's also dependent on what you write as text on the buttons and how, which color you gave them. But we have like reject and disable sync because I take my new device in, the, the dialogues come, and I say, no, I don't want to connect the two, and I want to say that with one button, and then shut up, right? Or, as I said, I have someone on, at the phone, the dialogues comes, and I say, cancel, not now, and go in the phone and enter some things, and then I expect the thing coming again, right? So that is basically how we decided. I'm not sure about that UI design, because we're not in the UI testing yet, we are just right before release now. So let's see if that survives. Um, reject, obviously, on the line would be a commit reject. It's the transaction being committed. And the result is, no, switch it off, right? Is the switch off for that other device, or is the switch off global for all other devices? Well, this is the case I have two sole devices. Yeah, but if I now later come as a third device, do I have to enable one of those two devices? 
overly cool. Oh, it's a different device you're trying to switch, so therefore I can... I no, if you switch it off, it's off. We also discussed that one, but you, then you're in, in the typical, uh, let's say you're locked in, because you only can do it wrong for one or the other user. So you need to, because expectations really go split here, so we, did, we opted for the case that if you switch it off, it's off and stays off, and if you cancel it, it's, you move the problem to later. That's what we do. Let's see if that survives. Okay, so then we send the commit reject, obviously, on the line. Close the transaction, transaction over, the answer is no, we don't do anything. And stop it. If we get a commit reject on the line and it's from the right partner, then we, switch, we accept that and switch it off. If we get an accept, that means form a group between the two, then this was combined with the trust words, right? The user sees the trust words dialogs. So that means trust the key. I call it this key. Why? Because the key is mentioned already in my input buffer because the message arrived and it was copied into the input buffer. So I can here trivially say trust this key which is in the input buffer because I'm reacting exactly on that message, right? Um, and Yes, and that will be a commit accept, of course, on the line. And then you have like a mesh of such options. Uh, maybe on this device, accept is being pressed first, and on the other device later, then I will send my message first, and the other will send it back later. Or it will be just other way around, because it's one user, right? So probably the user will not find an identical time where she or he will press that button, right? So probably the user will press it here and press it here and then will expect that it works, right? You don't know the users. <laughs> well, they always expect that it works. I think that's a safe bet. <laughs> Just make sure you handle the ways and they have that Yes. So what we do here, that gives this mesh here. You know, this is really the different states for I get first this, and afterwards this, or the other way around, and here you have really states in your state machine, right? For, for the different possibilities and combinations. And because that exactly matches the faces of a two-phase commit, I called them phase one and phase two, the states. That's again, the wording is coming uh, from distributed transactions, okay? And we're still in such a transaction, I think it's fair to call them phase one and phase two, because that's exactly what is meant in a two-phase commit with phase one and phase two. Let's point out. May I ask a question briefly about the end states, since we already were at that topic before? Um, well, there's no really end state without, uh, with the exception of disabled, there's more like stable state, like soul and grouped. Yeah, but the disabled state, end state. So suppose I yeah. hit the reject button, and I end up in the end state. Yeah. How do I get out of that? Um, well, you switch it on again in the options. Yes, but the question is, do I, can I switch on one device and the other device is also turned back on? Or can I switch it off and the other device is no. also turned back on? No, not supported. Yeah. Because you could have a message where I basically say, I'm, I was turned on again, and the other devices make a challenge, are you really on the same inbox? You know, and then they also turn themselves on again. You know, the inbox alone is not safe. No, but if, if I can prove to you that I can read the same inbox you are writing to... Uh, well, be careful. Okay, for the security model, because that's your question basically based on, I think. For the security model, if you want me sending you my private keys, you need to be, know more than the password of my inbox. Oh, oh no, I don't know. Because I, I, if I... <laughs> because I don't want, no, no, I don't want to be... I just want to re-enable the security part. Yes. So what I want to do is... Next thing both, is... We're both in the end state. Yes. My user says re-enable soon. Next thing is, if you want to annoy my user, you need to, meet, to have more too. More than access to his inbox? Yes. I think if I believe you have access to your inbox, uh, if you read and leave messages there, I can annoy you so much, the rest doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the reason for my product is that we provide measures and, and uh, implementation that this changes. Yeah, but right? if the maximum noise I can do is pop up this one dialogue, that's not, you know. 
You cannot pop up my dialog. Okay, that's a decision. I could do what you're yeah. suggesting. Let's see if my concept survives the user interface test, okay? We will try it out now, <laughs> also with, with uh, friends and family and then with customers. And let's see if that survives or if I implement something like you were suggesting. I did some, I needed to do a, a couple of decisions and I have no experience, so what I do is I try to make a good guess. And my guess is if my user says, shut up, I shut up. Yes, you're surprised because that's not me, right? <laughs> but okay. <laughs> that's just a decision. We, we could discuss that and you're right, there's other options. Okay. So that is the reason why you find, find that crazy mesh part here, right, for, for phase one and two, the different combinations. So I will not go into details here, we will just waste time because the same thing, but you yeah, attach the other way around, right? Okay. And of course, we have the same thing from the side of the offerer. And there is a metric again, because they got asymmetric by intention for doing the three-way handshake and now they are in a distributed transaction between two devices without defined roles and that means they are symmetric again. So it's like a copy. Why the hell do we have extra states? Can't we reduce them now to one state? No, we cannot. Why not? Because my inbox has that special type of thing, of property that I get my own messages, right? So I need different states and I need to differ between if it's coming from the other or it was coming from me, right? So I have extra states to handle that and that is why it's a copy. Basically for cell devices, now it's like a, a reflected copy, like a mirrored copy of it. So you have exactly the same shit and if you have a look at the state machine, it's expressing that here, right? And you end up in grouped, obviously. If you accept the trust, I'm just scrolling through all that different states, which are just uh, implementing the different combinations of sequences, what, how that shit could arrive in mirror copies, then it ends up with forming the group, right? And forming the group already had trust this key, you may remember that. And so there, there's two checks. One is if that is a trusted channel, but that's not enough. Because you may have a trusted channel to external communication partners, right? As well. So additionally, if it's exactly the same partner I'm talking to all the time. So you, you like start by enabling, by establishing the trust you pin down who that is, you have the trust for sync, not, not for all other cases, and then it's the trusted channel with the correct partner. And that is how we check it. And for such checks, sync has always double checks. So we check it always on the incoming side, and we check it with a, if possible, different algorithm on the outgoing side. And that is just, uh, hopefully, if we have a bug on one, you know, we are about exchanging secret keys, right? <laughs> so, we, we try to make it safe. So, as a safeguard, all checks are doubled at different places of codes with, if ever possible, different checks. And not only asserts because they are compiled out uh, <laughs> with the release, right? So, that's what we do. I don't know if we have the time for the implementation here, but uh, if not, I will put it in the next. And then, if that is all the case, then we accept keys and send out keys. And we do that by separating, sending which keys will it be and sending the actual keys. And we expect the message transport implementation to send the key data. And there's a reason for that because PEP is, is um, orthogonal to transport and crypto implementation, so there must be already some, some implementation of crypto and transport, whatever, however they do it, 
and we're asking them to attach uh, the secret keys and this is the list which they need to attach and that is the list which we announce because keysync, that's the part of keysync here, is also about that those keys get trusted as own keys, right? So it's also about trust and you must not do that without explicitly sending over safe channel to the right um, receiver which keys that receiver can trust now, right? Whatever they get from the transport as key data, they must even ignore that if it's not announced on the safe channel that this is now really the thing. So it's like sending the key data needs already a safe channel and sending the information if these are the keys which have to be trusted needs an extra safe channel that's uh, again double checking, right? So if you manage to tamper with the keys at least you don't get them uh, as own keys. If you can crack for example into the crypto implementation of the transport. So this is just double checking, there's no real meaning with it, it's just we wanted to have at all places, in all cases, double checking. Because it's about secret keys, we don't trust ourselves a little, right? So if things are going wrong, they, hopefully we, we can reduce the damage, right? And that's what we do. And that is then things like, then of course we can show that the group was creating a group, right? And then it's about which one will be the group keys. Well, all of them, obviously, you don't need, to, I should mention that, we have the extra problem that you may have configured email account A, B, and C on the phone, while you have email account A, D, and E on the laptop. Right? That's possible and common. So which keys get B exchanged? All of them. Because what must not happen to the user is, and that's packed now, when they click on some, on any email, it needs to be shown in clear text, right? So we exchange all of those keys with the exception, and that is now possible, you can configure a pet client. These are keys which I never share with Sync. These keys are not being synced. So you can configure, and you can configure that per account. So you can say, this is an email account I don't want to be in included in SIG. And if you disable that, there's the guarantee with double checking again, filtering them out even if they were not in, that keys for this email account will never appear in SIG. So that's a, a defined feature which is needed here, because I think, for example, if I have a private email account, and the laptop is from the company, probably I don't want to sync that, that one, right? Probably not. And that is a feature which we have. Because our user group is users, if they do that one wrong, but then start to encrypt, it's still way better if they don't. I'm so sorry, I'm a privacy activist. I should uh, repeat that. If we shut down mass surveillance by doing that, in many, many places, and people fuck up their security, it's better. So it's better than highly secure and the civilian works. It's just our decision, right? So what we do is we share, we share private keys for all accounts which you don't click off, you don't want to send them. That's what we do. You may dislike that, and there's good reasons to dislike that. From a security perspective, it's the wrong way to do it, okay? I'm aware of that. And I will not move from that point away. Because from a privacy perspective, it's exactly what we need to do it. Better they share too many keys between each other and the data creating is out than the other way around, right? That's from the privacy view. Because why uh, I founded the project was that we want to make it way more expensive for mass surveillance. And that gives the, the options. And you see, there is questionable decisions because of that, because privacy and security don't always go together, right? That's how it is. But that one, for example, is something um, I don't think I want to change. By default, they encrypt.
and it works on their devices, right? Okay, I, I think I'm already over time. So, <laughs> um, I could go further and we're not completely through, but I hope you got an impression what we're doing there. And uh, so far, are there any questions? Why the fuck is this so fucking complicated? Sorry? Why the hell is this so complicated? Like, I mean, why, do, why is there like a two case for this? Or like two, 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 two way handshake or whatever? I mean, why not just like make a damn password? Like, make use like to unplug in the crypto box, just send an email and keep the phone and on the other device and use the other passwords. And you can serve with peace. Okay, um, first. There is no reason why it's so complicated, which is based on there would not be technically no better options. I think this is one of the technically worst options you can choose. So that is obviously not the reason. I'm fully with you. There are way easier ways to do that, to achieve exactly the same goal. And those implementations are there and no one is using them. 7.5 billion users are not using it from 7.5001. Why? Well, I'm pretty sure like 7 billion are not using this either. So. Let's see. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> yeah, okay. You know, we are trying to be an upgrade. We are based, we are basing on this following situation. We as the crypto community, and I feel as a member of that mm. really in my heart, we are providing tools since more than 20 years. They don't use it. That's a fact. So I'm trying to analyze why not. And I tell you things, if you want to have my answer on that, my analysis result, what I think would be the reasons why they don't use it. If you have a hex code in, they will immediately reject it. With each button they need to press, you make your user, you cut your user base in half. So if it's one button like with PEP, it will be 3.5 maximum. If it would be two buttons, it's always the half of that. If you make it all inclusive 10 buttons, then you're not, then you're not uh, visible let's anymore. Let's have a beer after that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I love that offer, by the way. <laughs> so, so it's really, it's really all what I can see is if I read a manual how to generate a key, you know, I know after line two no one will do it. Yeah, but for example, you have a really nice implementation of WhatsApp and you could do it in an open source way that, well, if you want to share your laptop keys with your phone, right, you just like send an email, let's say it's an encrypted, like one, all your keys, one package encrypted, and whatever, your laptop displays a QR code, they have privacy to be good that the phone can scan it. And a pretty secure way, but not this just doesn't need to be any network connected to anything. Show me a way how it can be for so easy for the user that he gets a window and the only thing he has to choose is yes or no. Because oh, that's the result here. I mean, this is not that it's easy, that let's say but WhatsApp does this. And like millions of WhatsApp people. does not have my problem because it's a closed <laughs> central platform. Oh, but this is like a very easy. nice solution for key sharing. And well, it, that, it, I mean, sure. Okay. WhatsApp, next, next, next right? problem. Next problem. <laughs> next problem. I tell you, I tell you something which is forbidden in the user interface of PEP. We have a list of words you may even not mention. <laughs> key. <laughs> Encryption. Forbidden words don't appear in the user interface. Why not? If I even name them, I lose my user base. Yeah, but in my <laughs> this implementation, how many, how many users are using WhatsApp on multiple devices? Many. 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 WhatsApp is, is being no, used. No, on multiple devices. A lot of people have their phone and then they use it. Actually, WhatsApp doesn't do on the other device if your phone is not running. Yeah, of course. Nobody's nice about that. Okay, I'm, I'm just trying to, to, to frame you the problem how we see it. Yeah, and but to I explain why we opted for such a solution, the answer is don't mention that keys even exist. 
They won't mention that encryption exists. Show them if they can rely that this was a private message or not. For example, PEP is not signaling if the message was encrypted at all. PEP is signaling if the message, if you can rely as a user that this it was private. And of course we are using encryption to press that through. But if, if you get an encrypting message where our rating says you cannot rely on it, you don't get the signal. We don't differ for users between unencrypted and encrypted messages at all. So that is that is an approach we have. Of course, you can dislike that one as well. There may be no, no, I mean, other I approaches. Like I, mean, I, I really love that, and I agree with all the key stuff and the encryption. We should never mention the key to the user, but on, even on the back side, we shouldn't have like, this super complicated problem. You know, the idea is that we just generate the network stack out of that, and then we make it accessible for, for example, synchronizing your contacts peer-to-peer, -peer, and synchronizing your schedule if you want. So you can have shared calendars over that. And then if you compare it to the other protocols which are doing that, it's not complex, I think. I know that's a little weird. Um, we call that the PEP cloud, or the cloud 2.0, right? Not to have one. Because I think that's also in the interest of privacy that we, you don't need the, the cloud account, right? It's not needed. And that is where it's going to. So what you see here is, the reason for distributed transaction is, if you try to think through, you have already a group of devices and one extra device, and you want to be sure that one of the group accepts, which can do that for the group and the new device, show me a solution which is easier than a distributed transaction for that one, and I will join. Well, uh, we need to get a beer, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm fully agreeing I, on I, that I, point. I don't want to die... Uh, <laughs> fully agreeing on that point. Oh, okay. That's one question. Yes? Uh, two questions, in fact. Yes. How many round trips times do you need for a full group sync? Round trips? Groups? Yeah, well, you know, we can read that in the messages, right? So, all in all, I have 14 messages. Okay, so seven round trips. So this is beacon, negotiation request, open, and then I get an accept. Uh, two times, because distribute transaction. And then, uh, if I'm not a group, this thing is skipped. And then I get the keys. So how many was it? Six, I think. So it's six. Second question, is any of this more complicated because you want to stick it into SMSs? Specifically? Yes and no. Yes, let's say it's, it's complex also because I need to be, have it abstracted, you know. I cannot rely, for example, on the properties of email. At, at the same time, I cannot rely on the properties of SMS. I cannot rely on anything that just messages get transported and that may be unreliable. SMS, for example, is unreliable, right? So yes, in, in this view, actually, I think if I could assume more about the message transport, maybe it would not be six, it would be four, for example. Yes, then, then I could combine probably, um, probably I could, could send, for example, the keys already with accept and stuff like that. I could imagine it could be I'm not really sure. I don't think so. How can you send the key over SMS because keys are usually wrong? Uh, that's a complex question. Um, actually, I need to explain then concepts of PEP. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like key mapping, and uh, we could have, for example, we have uh, the possibility uh, that we split it to many SMSs and combine mm -hmm. the key data. That's there. And it's also possible that we actually split the information which key can be trusted and just hold the key data and it's coming later when you have better connection on a different channel that's supported. So it's, it's depending on how we do it on that channel and that's a fairly complex thing by the way again. So, but that's the, the topic um, transport system of PEP.
So that would be a, a own discussion, I think. But uh, I'm still with the beer. Yeah. <laughs> and somehow ended up with two distinct groups. Can they join them? No. Security reason. If we discuss that, if you join a group, you make the following attack vector possible. I, as an attacker, create a group between two devices and sell you one. And it's still grouped. If that device asks the stupid question, shall we join the groups, I found the second group, then the user needs to read that text. So it's a type of phishing attack vector, right? If the user expects already that that beast will ask a trusted dialog, and just not read the text that this is not the same group, right, and accept, well, the secret keys goes to the other device, which is still with the attacker, right? So we, we opted against that feature, intentionally, and do things like, like for example, if your device was too long not in a group, it leaves the group, it just drops back to soul. It, we, we do it like, um, this thing will just say nothing, and if you reboot sync by disable, enable it, you know, that is probably what user will do, because I think Microsoft Windows teaches that, <laughs> right? <laughs> so if they're following common patterns, it will just rejoin the group, right? So we rejected merging intentionally because of security issues. Uh, I give you an example for actual problems at PEP so you can just colorize that. One, re one big problem today we have with GMX um, is that if you send a, a PEP, a mail from a PEP client to, to a GMX user, and the GMX user is using the web interface of GMX, that, that user cannot read the email of PEP. By the way, this email was unencrypted and they cannot read it anymore. Why? Because GMX had the, the great idea, you know, they are supporting PGP using that, uh, how is the plugin named? I forgot the name. It's one of the open source plugins even, for PGP in a browser. And they now had the idea, they see that PEP could encrypt, uh, the other guy has a PEP client, they see, wow, he could encrypt it then. And then they show a big window, you could encrypt with that guy, just you need to configure encryption here as well. And I have a user, that's an actual real case out of practice now, I have a user who is not good in seeing, you know, with his glasses, uh, his glasses are fairly thick, so he does not use them at the screen, and so he made the, the, the font of his web browser fairly big. And so this user said to us that since his friend has PEP, he cannot read the emails anymore, because the mail is still unencrypted, because he would need to scroll down, right? Because there is the unencrypted mail. And that's not possible. Oh, it's possible. Uh, that's Just that's that that user does not understand the text. That's exactly why the code is so very complex. Yes, that's why it's that's complex. The, the user does not understand the text. It's in German language, because it's a German provider, and the user is German native speaker. Yeah. And on, the, on that thing is standing, I, I say it in English, the partner you got the message from is able to encrypt. We could be able as well. If you want to encrypt, you can press install here, install the plugin, and then you can answer encrypted. Uh, but he does not understand that text. For him, he took it as, well, the message is encrypted, I cannot read it. I don't know about encryption, fuck, they must be geeks. <laughs> uh, um, service call, um, I cannot read your message. I cannot read that message here, and that's my friend, it's important, I need to read it. And all what this user would need to do is scroll. It's an unencrypted one. And so that is the real world, you know? And that is why the word encryption is forbidden in the user interface, right? It's not appearing. And, and the word key is idle. But then why, then, why just not simply forbid the word TGP in whatever you send in whatever you see? Uh, if, I, if I would <laughs> recommend that, you know, uh, the P2P guys would even dislike me more. 
<laughs> right? I should not. I should not do that. It's not all of them. Some are just great, and we are friends. And there's a, a small group who dislike me. Okay. And by the way, Pep is not P2P. So HTML is sent in the body of email. Why don't you just hide the encrypted contents? Sorry? Why don't you use CSS in the email to hide encrypted contents? <laughs> um, ever heard of e-fail and colleagues? Hmm? Do, do you ever, do you ever find uh, HTML emails? You, 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 with that question, I just comment on it. You, you open Pandora's box with that question, right? Right. You open Pandora's box. By the way, no PEP client ever was weak against e-fail because we took out. Both attack vectors they combined, we took out by design. I can show that, but that is something I would even require a beer for that, okay? No, no, no but if all of us have your design is take off as mine. It's not even PGP, as mine, right? Uh, we don't know, you know, we have an own design and we try to be compatible to the two of them. I mean, EFL basically does, uh, well, it is a common mistake in cryptography, which is taught everywhere, just if you receive garbage, don't display it. It's as simple as that. Garbage. I fully agree with that one. I fully yes, agree with that one. That's exactly what we do. If it's garbage, don't display it. I fully agree with that. One. No, 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 don't even decode it. Like, yes. Garbage. Fully agreed on that one. That's it. On the that's same page. Okay. Any other questions or beer? Beer. Beer. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>